I'm really delighted to introduce our speaker today, uh, Helen Collins, who is currently the acting principal at Trinity College Bristol, uh, where she is uh, a member of the teaching staff. And I think I'm right in saying ordinarily she's vice principal. Um, you can correct me on that, Helen. There you are. Um, uh, I'd like to say that Helen and I have worked very hard to line up our bookshelves, um, although uh, I'm wondering whether someone will in future gift me these rather snazzy uh, little extra. I'm not quite sure what it is, Helen, but anyway, it's very colourful. Yeah, crochet is uh, one of my passions, as you will see. So. Oh, I see. All oh, right. Well, uh, don't feel you have to send me any, but it's uh, they certainly brighten up the edge of a bookshelf and uh, help us look as they were almost uh, in the same room. Um, Helen, are you ordinarily the vice principal of Trinity? Is that right? Yes, that's right. Vice principal academic with responsible for our academic programmes. Great. And uh, in particular, the reason that, um, that we've invited Helen to be part of the series is that she has written this book, Charismatic Christianity, introducing its theology through the gifts of the spirit um, and um, uh, well we will talk about this uh, in some depth um, over the coming minutes but it's um, I think a really uh, incredibly helpful and also in a sense exciting uh, contribution um, to these questions about the place of the Holy Spirit uh, in the life of the church um, and one of the things for those of you who joined last week with Lucy Pepiat, we're wanting to do is, is hear a little bit about um, the personal significance of the spirit in uh, someone's life as then the kind of academic or theological outputs. Um, so Helen, could you begin perhaps by telling us a little of your Christian journey and particularly the work of the Holy Spirit in that? Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for having me on this. Uh, it's great to be here. And thank you to those of you that have joined in person or maybe later online. Um, I grew up in a traditional Anglican church, um, robes, robed choir, um, processions, um, and it wasn't until I was 11 where I went to um, a charismatic conference for the first time, didn't really know what we'd gone along to. Uh, I talk about it a bit more in the book, but had really powerful encounters with the Holy Spirit in the children's groups. Um, of kind of tangible senses of God's presence. Um, I remember there being um, holy laughter, um, speaking in tongues, um, people, uh, children praying for one another, um, different gifts of the spirit being manifest. And just this sense of my faith really coming alive and being my own for the first time in a way that in um, the Anglican church, I just accepted various things, but hadn't, um, yeah, I hadn't really under kind of I wasn't living that um in a in a way that was present and real for me. Um and then being confirmed in my Anglican church was kind of how I responded to this encounter with the spirit. Um and those journeys continued through my teenage years um of encountering the Holy Spirit, worshiping in a church, uh experiencing the significance of the Eucharist, reading the scriptures, being in different study groups. Um and that led me to study theology at university, um, where I continue to hold together these different uh, traditions and aspects of spirituality. Um, yeah. Just and, like uh, and what happened, uh, I mean, at what point did uh, ordination loom? Um, yeah, well, I should. I started doing chemistry at university um, and changed after six days. Sorry to any chemists out there, but it just wasn't what my life was, uh, was supposed to be about, I quickly realised. Um, and in the change to theology, my mum has, she's ordained. She was in her training for ordination at that period. Um, and people would say, oh, are you going to follow in your mum's footsteps? And I was very resistant to that uh, suggestion as an 18-year-old. Um and it was, um, it was, I trained as a teacher, I lived abroad, um, and it was during uh, when I was living in London and working for a local church, um, that my sense of kind of vocation really came alive and was nurtured by a great team that I was working with there. Um, and I was doing some MA study at the time as well, kind of into um, religion, theology. Um, yeah, so I guess I came to it relatively early. Um, I think I've been ordained 14 years now. Um that's fascinating. Um I mean I'm I'm really interested because uh, you know I too grew up in a very traditional context and then was 
rather surprised by uh, encounters with the Holy Spirit, though a little bit later on in, in my Christian life uh, than you. Um, but I suppose when you now look across the church, um, what is it that you long to see the Holy Spirit do uh, that, you know, perhaps, um, yeah, I mean, not everything in the life of the church is perfect, is it? So what, what do you long for? Mm. Um. A prayer I often find myself praying, you know, those prayers that come, that come, that are kind of prayed through you, I think, by the Spirit, um, is that the Spirit would unleash a, um, just a real love of the scriptures, of the traditions um, among those who are called to minister the gospel in different places. Um, and that from that might flow a real deep unity and sense of reconciliation among different uh, traditions and different perspectives. Um, and yeah, that that energy, that vitality, that boldness um, that the spirit can bring. Um, and a real sense of, I think, um, en enjoyment in, in our faith, um, that which we receive as, as gift and being able to delight in that and share that in confident but winsome ways uh, with our communities. Um, yeah, come Lord Jesus, that's what I would, uh, I would love to see um, pray yeah. for. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so I should say to everyone, um, uh, Helen and I will be sort of speaking in this kind of way for another, I don't know, 20 minutes or so. And then we will open up to uh, questions and uh, comments. So please do uh, put things in the chat, um, particularly if you if you hear something and you think, oh, I'd love to um, hear a bit more. I will certainly happily respond to things put in the chat, um, it, you know, now rather than later. Um, but if you would like to put a particular question, please do that. And that was a really um, helpful part of last week's uh, time together. And also a reminder, if you are here for the first time, at around about 10 to 2, we'll move into a time uh, of prayer. And again, if, uh, if any of you would like to pray as part of that time, uh, you would be most welcome to, uh, to do so. Um, so, Helen, you've written this book, as I say, Charismatic Christianity, introducing its theology through the gifts of the Spirit. And um, what was the, the purpose in, in writing? Um, so I my PhD research was looking at charismatic worship and theology um, and particularly using using the lens of motherhood to look at this experience of how one's spirituality can radically change through a different period of life and how um, kind of interrogating then some of those theological assumptions, practices, traditions that I had taken for granted and that had sustained and nurtured my own spirituality for many years, suddenly finding those in quite um, a degree of disarray during having young children and the care of those and not being able to rely on those um, spiritual practices in the way that I had. And so that prompted me to kind of engage in um PhD research. I use qualitative methods of kind of interviewing mothers, engaging with different church traditions. Um, and I I enjoyed that piece of work. That was a completed piece of work. And some of my writing that flowed from that was further exploring kind of a, um, a theological method, what's distinctive about being a, a charismatic in terms of how we do theology. Um, and lots of uh, books out there already that are engaging with and asking those questions. Um, but the place of the spiritual gifts, I think I really wanted to explore. How are they already kind of carriers of the faith commitments that we profess? And those charismatic Christianity is often derided in the literature for being kind of Pentecostal light or for not being very academic or for not being very um not being very scholarly. And it has had a, a history and a tradition of kind of not wanting to engage um with those more rational, cerebral um ways ways of thinking um and i think i wanted to argue that actually there is deep theological reflection that is contained within the practices that we uh, inhabit and perform together that they um yeah they they are the doctrinal commitments but actually to reflect on those with a bit more um rigor and intentionality and focus to understand what is going on there what are some of the gifts what are some of the challenges um and living that out in a community of trinity which is you know known to be broadly charismatic broadly evangelical but seeing kind of students 
uh, understand that differently, have senses of um, frustrations with others in, in how that's kind of lived out in a particular Christian community. Um, and the church that I'm presently attending isn't really, um, wouldn't describe itself as charismatic. Um, and so just wanting to kind of have the opportunity to look at and wrestle with those different uh, themes. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, I I was reminded reading your book um, of, um, you know, someone using the phrase in relation to charismatic mm -hmm. renewal, oh, well, that's the lunatic fringe. And um, I, I suppose you're, you're really writing a polemic against that sense of um, a kind of um, sort of casual, sometimes slightly snide dismissal of what's going on in charismatic theology and practice. Yeah, I think I'm trying to do two things at the same time, which is always um, challenging and means you probably never do either of them well. But that sense of the way in which um, how can charismatic Christianity within Pentecostalism, there's definitely a growing um, academic um, body of literature and scholars who are writing from a distinctively Pentecostal perspective. Um, even within that literature, charismatic Christianity is either kind of contained within it or seen as a sort of a, a less significant subset. And so, um, but then beyond kind of a Pentecostal charismatic tradition, definitely an enduring suspicion or uh, um, looking down a kind of you'll grow out of that, you know, that a, a, the teenage time of faith development potentially it may have been referred to and oh you you grow out of that and so wanting to kind of very much resist that and say no actually there are there are contrib theological uh contributions within charismatic um spirituality and practice that can um that has something to say and contribute to wider church discourse so that was the one side is the kind of advocacy for that the flip side is kind of wanting to speak to the tradition and say, mm, yeah, but hang on a minute. While there may be gifts that we have to offer to the wider church, there are also a ton of things that we need to receive and learn. And I think um, a charismatic tradition has maybe historically been or has been guilty of um, an arrogance potentially or that kind of dismissal of academic study or of other traditions as, um, you know, suspecting the salvation of other denominations because of how they may or may not practice and wanting to say, actually, there are things we have to learn as well as things we have to give. And so I'm trying to um, I'm trying to advocate for kind of wider ecumenical um, engagement towards charismatics and towards a wider ecumenical uh, world to say, yeah, charismatics have something important and significant to bring to the table. Yeah, I mean, um, I don't know if you're aware, but there are certainly some people on the call who are involved with our uh, history project on the the history of charismatic renewal 1960 mm. to 2000 and for me one of the things that we keep being reminded of uh, in that is the sheer unity energy of those early years of charismatic renewal and um, the conference at Guildford Cathedral uh, in 1971 bringing together uh, just this extraordinary diversity of Christians of varying commitments and seemingly the the particular significance actually of of Protestant evangelicals and Roman Catholics um, mm -hmm. coming together and realising it was the same God they were worshipping, the same spirit that was uh, filling them. Um, and depending on our own backgrounds, you know, there's always some part of the vine that we secretly believe is, you know, in another vineyard, frankly, isn't there? And, mm -hmm. and you know, so I love the, the impetus towards unity that you're describing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. I mean, you. I'm teeing you up to to share more. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I am um, kind of having the opportunity to read more into Catholic charismatic renewal and seeing different renewal movements um, around the world and historically wanting to kind of. Um, I think in in my introductory chapter, I'm kind of questioning definitions that we might use. You know, what do we mean by Pentecostal? What do we mean by charismatic? Um, and part of the um, kind of um yeah motivation for the whole book was what do we mean when we use these terms um and i guess for within a kind of pentecostal perspective there's often a strong emphasis on the acts too the the narrative you know the, the story of pentecost um and it was within the gifts of the spirit that i particularly wanted to locate a actually a, a distinctively charismatic perspective within that um and seeing the way in which and the way i've understood them fairly broadly and diversely 
that helps us to then recognize the work of the spirit in traditions that we wouldn't call Pentecostal or charismatic, but can absolutely see the, the gifting and the movement and the work of the spirit um, in, um, you know, that hard work of building unity, those works of reconciliation, the service or love um, are, are manifestations of the spirit in different places. And so, um, yeah, wanting to uh, to celebrate and recognise uh, that unity that the spirit brings. Yeah. Um, I wonder if I could ask you about healing as mm. one example, really, because um, it strikes me as a, um, a, a, a good example of, of what you're doing in the book, that you take this um, practice that is very much associated with, with the charismatic, but you're also... Uh, unafraid to tackle the potential shadow side or the the pastoral implications of uh, seemingly unanswered prayer. And um, I I suppose sometimes I worry that charismatics, we're we're kind of cantering ahead with the miraculous and we're delighting in that. But do we have the theology for the disappointment or the seemingly unanswered prayer? Um, But you you face that head on. Yeah. So again, I'm trying to do two things at the same time, which is to say I absolutely believe in the power of prayer and the power of the spirit to bring healing that we may not be able to explain in any way other than the language of miracle. Although what we mean by that, um, again, I go into a little bit in the book in terms of what even is a miracle and how might we understand that. Um, And wanting to say there are huge challenges with this that we're aware of. Um, we don't want to shy away from those challenges, but those challenges don't make us actually, let's just, it's all too risky and too difficult and too uh, pastorally fraught. So let's just not focus on the uh, those miraculous ways in which God might heal. Um, and recognize that healing is much broader and more diverse than um this kind of zapped um, transformation that we might look to um, and that somebody can feel themselves healed if what we mean by that is a sense of um, wholeness and reconciliation with self, with community, with God and with wider world, that that can be experienced even while physical uh, pains, disability struggles continue um, and that for someone to be physically well and yet isolated and alone um, without a sense of community or purpose or connection with God is actually, um, you know, is, is broken, isn't isn't what they're intended to be. Whereas somebody can be experiencing deep levels of um, pain and difficulty and yet know themselves held and loved within a community and have a sense of purpose and minister out of that you know, for the sake of others and can know God deeply and powerfully in those moments. And so how it's really difficult to champion healing as something that we can pray for and look to and be reconciled to the fact that healing, our our prayers may be being answered, just our definitions of healing have been slightly narrowed or slightly unhelpful. Um, I'm living this presently with a a young member of my family who is in quite a critical condition as I speak. And I long to see a miracle of God's healing, transforming work that her situation would, you know, would would change in ways that astound the medical professionals that are presently caring for her. And at the same time, I rejoice in the way that the spirit is working in and through those medical professionals. Um, And this, you know, she, when compared with other periods around the world and in history, she has the most incredible um, care that's being, um, you know, ministered to her by those who have that skill and who've developed that over time and being able to see God absolutely at work and to be able to celebrate in, in those gifts and in those opportunities and to um to give thanks to god for the ways in which the spirit would work through those as well um and continue to hope for the the miracle at the same time um and find what reconciliation and peace and hope might look like should you know the the desired outcome not be realized what does it mean to continue to say that god is love Um, And that God is good in those places of agonizing loss and pain when the prayers that we pray don't seem to have been answered. Um, And knowing the spirit who groans with us and with the whole of creation as we await the fight, like all healing that we presently experience is pointing to that 
eschatological uh, renewal of the whole of creation. And so even as we celebrate in the miracles or in the, the healing professional um, work of healing, um, we yet away our, our, our final transformation by the spirit. And the spirit groans with us as we await that. And I'm wanting to say yes and yes and yes and hold and seeing how the spirit will join and hold those together, that, it, that it's by the spirit that each of those are um, enlivened and lived out and realised. Yeah. Um, and I, I noticed you you named, for example, emotionalism, exaggeration, triumphalism, sensationalism as some of the uh, the dangers um, within charismatic healing ministries. Mm. Yeah. Um, I sadly, I think we could all tell a uh, a story of when it's been misused and abused, uh, when people have been given false hope, when it's been built up to be, you know, it, it's all about the healer, when people have been told that they don't have sufficient faith um, for this healing to happen, when guilt has been placed on people, um, that sense of disappointment when there hasn't been the pastoral care. Um, and that's where I'm wanting to pair the gifts, the recognition that the spirit gives the gifts for the building up of the body and none of the gifts are given in isolation in this sense of uh, to one is given uh, the gifts of healing, to another is given the gifts of tongues, to another is given the gifts of um, service or leadership or these different things and how they're designed to work together. And so we can see there's a gift of healing, but there are also gifts of good administration, which can bring um, a kind of wholeness and reconciliation to a community who have been in disarray through through bad leadership and management there are ministries of helping that is just that kind of making meals for people who are sick or um you know being there to listen or babysitting or whatever it is those kind of small acts of service that also can enable people to feel um connected to a wider community uh that can kind of participate and share their own gifts that can also minister healing to people um yeah and how how do we as a charismatic church equally celebrate the gifted leader on the stage and the quiet unseen person making tea in times of crisis because the spirit doesn't um kind of different it's not the spirit that's saying oh this this person and their gift is more important than these others um and what would it mean to equally foreground and celebrate and delight in um those more normal or ordinary moves of the spirit as we seek to participate with god um and await and hope the um yeah the unexpected transforming work of the spirit where we um yeah where we say, wow, like that, that must have been, or we, we believe and trust that God was at work there. Um, yeah. And at the same time, the work of a community staying together, loving each other, serving each other, bearing with one another through all of the pains and disappointments of frustration that it means to live with Christians, that equally should be a place where we say, wow, only God <laughs> could be at work in that community and in that place. It doesn't have to be in the seeming miraculous that we um, affirm the work of the spirit. And so yeah. avoiding playing those off against one another. Yeah. Um, I'm struck that, I mean, would you say partly what you're doing is encouraging the charismatic part of the church to be more um, alert to sort of self-criticism, but learning to do that in a way that isn't about, um, you know, tearing each other apart or, or anything like that? Because I, I suppose I feel there are enough people who aren't enthusiastic about the charismatic, who are um, quite happy <laughs> to point out flaws and failures. But it's a different kind of thing to do that from within a movement where you're saying, as you are, actually, I do believe that God can do these things. I also believe, though, that platforms can be abused and et cetera, et cetera. Um, yeah, so I think... I think one of my hopes for the book is to give charismatics a kind of confidence and a language in both their practices and beliefs um, to, yeah, as I said before, boldly and winsomely with love and grace, um, live out a commitment to a particular understanding of how the spirit works in the church and in the world. Um, 
and see themselves as part of if the body metaphor and gifts work on kind of a local church or kind of community level. I think they also maybe work on a global church level and um, the way in which the spirit works in the charismatic church in particular ways that itself is a charism for the whole body of Christ globally and historically um, in a way that the Catholic Church has its particular charisms that the spirit works through um, and um, the Methodist Church and the um, Lutheran Church and, um, you know, um, and all of the other those kind of different expressions. What are the different charisms that the spirit is at work in and how do we each um, bring our gifts for the sake of the whole and do so in? Um, in non-defensive ways that are recognizing what we have to bring and also what we have to receive and what we have to learn that, you know, no part can say, I have no need of you, is Paul's metaphor. The eye can't say to the foot, I have no need of you. We don't get to rule other people out. It's only by the spirit um, who joins together the different parts as um, as is pleasing to God. Um, and so both that kind of confidently living out that faith and being equally open and hospitable and willing to learn from others um, such that we might both be enriched by those different expressions. And I guess um, we, you take the, um, the gift of healing or of evangelism. The idea is that the person who has that particular charism, which is received as, as gift, it's given by the spirit. It's an ongoing kind of reception of the spirit. It's not that they do all of that work for the whole body. It's that they model it in a particular way that encourages the whole body to engage in acts of evangelism or acts of healing. Um, and similarly, I think the charismatic church is encouraged to embody uh those commitments to um, I have my the emphases. So the book's based around seven emphases that all begin with E. Um, and for me, those are maybe the particular distinctives that the charismatic church bring to the table. And as we live out and embody those emphases in a way that I guess uh, see a growing sense of expectancy or enjoyment or um, an enchanted understanding of the world proliferate through through the wider body. And at the same time, we're shaped in our understanding of what that means through our wider engagement. I don't know if that answered your question just then. I was I off think, on one. <laughs> I think that'll do. I, th uh, um, I was also really interested by what you said earlier about um, uh, an ability to engage winsomely uh, with the wider world. And um, I, I think I, I find myself thinking about this a lot. You know, how does one hold together the fact that um, you're wanting to make a kind of coherent case for Christian faith, but at the same time, at the very heart of the charismatic experience, maybe something that literally makes no sense. And how do you hold that in intention in a way that is attractive to people who may not have given Christian faith much serious thought? Yeah, and I suppose for me, this is where, so I draw on the fruit of the spirit just as much as the gifts of the spirit. And in a sense, we can be guilty, I think, of a church of emphasizing the gifts of the spirit. And in a sense, that's what my book is doing, but it's trying to do so in the context of actually the fruit of the spirit. If our um, praying for healing is not done in a kind of um, a mode of love, then it's not potentially the work or it's not, um, it's not. Uh, reflecting the work it's not disclosing the work of the spirit in the world um if our efforts to pray for miracles are not informed by a sense of our hope that god will reconcile the whole of creation um to god's self in christ by the spirit and that sense of the peace that will pervade the whole of creation eschatologically um as our end hope if our um casting out of demons and our sense of the dualism of the world um doesn't have this kind of underwriting sense of the peace that the spirit brings, then again, maybe it's um, it, it has gone awry. And so how the that winsome embodiment, I think, is about recognizing, celebrating, seek, earnestly seeking after the fruits of the spirit, um, not that we can make them grow, but this sense of the way in which we inhabit um, together um in in communities of faith and seek to to live out and rejoice in and celebrate where we see signs of the fruit of the spirit just as much as the gift of the spirit and we use the fruits as kind of test cases or barometers to how effective somebody might seem to have a very effective prophetic ministry um but if it's not done with kindness and gentleness then again is 
is it the um the spirit of jesus christ um that brings glory to to god um and uh, yeah earnestly seeking after and celebrating the fruits i think is one of the ways that our lives then give testimony to the things that we claim that we believe and that we practice um you know people might not fully understand the doctrinal claims that we make or the practices that we inhabit but you kind of intuit if somebody is kind and gentle and joyful and peaceful um and that often is a uh a motivation to kind of inquire and find out more what they're saying sounds crazy but man these people love one another and what's and why and what's that about because i can't see any reason why they would um so i want to know more well preach it that's what i say <laughs> um <laughs> i'm um, i'm delighted that uh, some people have contributed to the chat um and so um i'm going to bring in some of these and if you hear uh, me refer to you and you'd like to jump in and add um, something you know please do unmute yourself and, and do so but I know some people um, are just listening without camera and uh, want to carry on that way which is absolutely fine um, now um, well we're Dave diving straight in with a technical question here Helen so um, Mark has said early in the book you've got a reader early in the book you make a distinction between the charismatic and the pneumatological could you expand on this, i.e., why isn't everything that is pneumatological included in what you call charismatic, or does your focus on gifts lead you away from this? That's what he said, so I hope that makes sense. Yeah, thank you. Um, I guess I am wanting to distinguish between, you know, there's um, a ton of literature that would, abs you know, the... Um, God, who is Father, Son and Holy Spirit, this recognition that the Spirit is part of our triune confession in who the Christian God is, um, and therefore writings that seek to reflect on who the Spirit is, what the Spirit does, um, would for me encapsulate this kind of pneumatological understanding that there is a Spirit, the Spirit is part of creation, the Spirit is part of redemption um, and salvation, the Spirit is part of um, the eschatological renewal of all things. Um, for me, the charismatic distinctive, um, which is more about, um, it's probably less about the technical meanings of the words and more about associating the conversations with certain groups of people. So charismatic is associated with those gifts of the spirit, that tangible sense of the spirit at work in our lives, in our communities, in felt, in, in embodied ways. Um, our hearts warmed, our souls enlivened, our passions deepened, our hope um expanded our joy overflowing those ways in which the spirit um works in ways that we seek to point to and recognize i guess is how i'm using um the language of charismatic to distinguish it from a more generalized understanding of the holy spirit as part of a trinitarian confession um but as i say that's more about um to speak of uh to speak about charismatic is to join a wider conversation that you know, um, has been used since long before I was born in terms of recognising a particular denominational or um, expression of spirituality. So I'm, I'm, I'm wanting to retain that language, both because it's biblical, but also because it helps associate it with those communities that I'm seeking to write from and to. Yes, and I suppose it, it seems to me that part of what you're doing is uh, giving the charismatic a certain confidence in saying, um, I'm hugely influenced and inspired by that, which would be sort of full fat Pentecostal, if you like. But actually, this is a distinct tradition and understanding which has huge overlap, particularly yeah. Pentecostals, but but not a total overlap. Um, and I suppose you do that in other directions with perhaps more sacramental theology, for example. Yeah, I think you answered the question. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. Well, let's carry on. Um, <laughs> uh, Matthew says, in what sense can we say every experience of the reality of God is charismatic? For example, in silence before the reserved sacrament mm -hmm. or in the midst of a conference singing in tongues? This is a, a, a lovely example because it reminds me of a former colleague who I thought was as about as thoroughgoing Protestant as you could imagine, uh, and would have no time for benediction or prayer in front of the sacrament until he went um, and spent some time with um, the nuns from the order that Mother Teresa uh, founded and discovered that their whole prayer life was inspired by this uh, 
uh, prayer in front of the sacrament and uh, it sort of blew his mind and um, it meant he preached a sermon quite unlike one I ever thought would come out of his mouth but um, but what do you think about this uh, is you know how do we how do we say whether a particular experience is charismatic or not um I I guess I'd want to say to both of those examples yes uh, I if uh, I would want to use the language of you know and an, um, an encounter with the Holy Spirit. Um, again, I think it's that distinction around, um, you know, the, um, I'm going to misquote Paul here, but the, um, you know, the spirit who uh, who kind of brings alive your faith, he makes it, it makes it known within within our hearts. We um, it's by the spirit that we cry, Abba, Father, um, that sense of um, the uh, the experiential um embodied knowledge of our um our identity as children of god in and through christ um that that um that itself is a gift uh, it's not something we can manufacture or make happen uh, it's not something we can work up or manipulate it's something that we receive faith is gift and that sense of god's presence the spirit in our hearts that see you know that cries abba father and um that recognition and response to God with the whole of our lives. And so if that happens in benediction, if that happens up a mountaintop, if that happens in uh, speaking in tongues or sung worship, then praise the Lord. Um, I think towards the end of the book, I get to the sense that having made that pneumatological charismatic distinction, you know, I would want to say all Christianity um, is charismatic to the sense of it is seeking to be an uh, embodied, holistic, cognitive, emotive, relational, material response to god by the spirit um that is um life transforming um and encountered um in ways that we can give testimony to where we just where we know that we know that we met with the spirit of the living god um and we are forever changed um so yeah i think in that sense i'm wanting to be very broad in my understanding of charismatic um having um, and partly because the, the gifts that I'm focusing on aren't just prophecy, tongues, healing, miracles, which are the standard charismatic gifts. But it's trying to say actually to be charismatic is to is to affirm and celebrate all of the gifts, those that um, and in a sense, it's um, it, it's wanting not to make such a distinction between the ordinary secular and the sacred spiritual, the sense in which the spirit of God infuses the whole of creation um, and can be encountered in. But is the spirit that points to Jesus Christ. Um, And so it's as we're up a mountain or it's as we're in those places, how is the spirit leading us to make the confession that Jesus is Lord? Uh, It's only by the spirit that we can do that and that we can say Abba Father in response to knowing that we are in Christ. Um, So yeah, all of it. Um, I want to ask you about demons in a minute because oh, um, yes. one of the favourite phrases um, uh, I found in your book was okay. your uh, sort of exhortation, really, to remain Christ-centred rather than demon-obsessed, but not to um, completely uh, deny that. But now this may may or may not be related, but um, Paul Greenland um, says, how would you deal with a member of a leadership who is rather domineering and who keeps saying, the Lord told me? Um, Paul, I don't know if you want to come in and, and add any more um, context. I don't want to sort of say more than you're um, wanting uh, to um, say. I, um, this was going on for about two years and I was keep saying, go and get, you know, the council of the elders and whatever, because I'm not sure about this. And in the end, I had to say, I'm sorry, I can't go along with this anymore. Uh, it was sort of believing he was receiving words from god about party politics mm-hmm. and um you know the lord's told me that um liz truss is going to be elected and stuff like that and uh in the uh, it wasn't just well, that, was that no, no, attitude. No, no. I'm, I'm, I'm not no, making any comment about party politics myself but it was that attitude that he couldn't be challenged because god had told him yeah and the end, that led to me saying i'm sorry i can't go along with this anymore i'm just I've had it. I can't. If you're not prepared to go and um, check this out, test the spirits, then I'm not prepared to continue. And it, it's an extremely painful time because I've been friends for 35 years and I've been a trustee for what, eight years or so. Yeah, thank you. It suddenly Paul. got much worse. It suddenly got much worse. Yeah. 
those and I again thank you for sharing that I think many of us would recognize similar uh, experiences I guess that sense of God speaks to the church um, is you know deeply biblical and so the ways in which if God's spoken to you about something well okay how there needs to be a an openness to the spirit speaks to us and the spirit has spoken to the church over very many years and in other communities and so this isn't just about us in this location how are we listening from and learning to others how are we open-handed in allowing that to be tested um the humility again this is where the fruits yeah, so of the lack, spirit um lack the, of humility absolute lack of humility in this yeah sense. um and so if and where those fruits of you know just even the love and care of listening to somebody else and allowing their perspective to inform our own um you know is part of what it means i think to live um, a life shaped by the fruits of the spirit um and so absolutely and recognizing that the intersections between saying that from a place of power the lord has told me mm-hmm. um versus saying it from the margins um and there is something about maybe God has said that, but often time and hindsight will bear it out. It's often with hindsight that we see that the prophets were the prophets that we yeah, thought yeah. them to be rather than in advance of that. And we all know what happens to the prophets um, in the the history of God's people. And so people who are standing in those places, I guess, need to be prepared to recognize that. uh yeah, the the prophets. It's not. It's certainly not an easy place to stand somewhere, um, and and that might well be rejected and not heard. Um, but that it's together we seek to discern that and recognize and how, what what kind of power are you holding as you're saying that, and the impact that that's having on people needs to be carefully carefully weighed. Thank you. Um, I said I wanted to ask you about um, demons because I think yeah. you um, you do face the uh, questions about evil, uh, the inspiration of of evil, the impact of evil in a way in which I I wonder whether quite often um, charismatics these days are a little bit concerned, um, possibly for legitimate reasons of, of safeguarding and proper practice and, and that kind of thing, but but actually your um, yeah, you you you're keen for us to think seriously about the demonic. Yeah, I, uh, however uncomfortable uh, it might feel, I think in the book I talk about the kind of we are anomalous globally um, and historically for thinking that uh, a kind of wider spiritual realm is not influencing the material As Western world. Western Christians, yeah, yeah. yeah um the the world in which we live and therefore i think we have we have a great amount to learn from other traditions and perspectives in relation to that it can often be a um yeah a very arrogant stance of oh now we know better and actually recognizing that we're we're quite anomalous in asserting that when you look globally and historically um pastorally and missionally when you engage with the uh brutal horrific things that are happening every day even right now as as we speak in this sense of you know the 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 power of sin and um and yeah the way in which we are our battle is not against flesh and blood but it is against the the principalities and powers um within this world and also jesus took you know the reality of evil very seriously um and the reality of demons very seriously and so that fought that you know causes me and I think us as a church to continue to say again with humility with caution with um this sense of um wanting to learn being open-handed recognizing that nothing um if if we if we are uh body soul spirit mind emotions relationships as human beings then all of those factors whether it be um illness or dysfunction in different places um even if the cause may be you know a material cause it will have uh things that happen to us influence our uh the whole of who we are the all of those dimensions of what it means to be human are impacted by different different things that might happen and so therefore how we can have a um, a therapeutically integrated approach to different situations or different things that recognizes um the material causes and symptoms, the emotional causes and symptoms, and the spiritual causes and symptoms, and again, how we how we do that wisely and carefully and winsomely, um, but also with a sense of of boldness and recognition that this, um, yeah, as we seek to uh, 
uh, interpret the scriptures and follow in the footsteps of Jesus. Um, yeah, and I guess it's moving on from from the old uh, C.S. Lewis adage of of either taking this far too seriously or not too, taking it seriously at all, but actually coming to a more holistic view, uh, but which doesn't negate the place uh, of um, thinking positively of the, the charismatic and the work of the spirit, but but mm. uh, negatively too in terms of of, of evil and sin. Mm-hmm. And this is where, you know, it is, it's hugely pastorally fraught. And so therefore that should encourage us to, we need really good and robust safeguarding processes. We need accountability. We need processes and systems that, you know, people are, um, are challenged, are, are encouraged to learn, to go on learning, to go on reading and understanding, um, you know, ongoing, um, ministerial and clergy development for me should absolutely include ongoing theological study we front load so much of that um in in the church of england anyway and kind of training and and that ongoing study learning reading seeking to um to understand in order to inform ministry to remain teachable humble open um and um that sense of uh boldness um to yeah, discern what the spirit might be doing and what's going on in different situations. Yeah, thank you. Um, Felicity has asked this. And Felicity, I don't know if you want to come in as well, but um, to to what extent do you think the charismatic has become identified with a particular cultural expression of Christianity? Uh, and to what extent is this helpful or unhelpful? I mean, certainly in terms of the work of resource, that's a, a massive um aspect of what we're doing often either unpicking people's prejudices about what they don't want because they see what you know engaging with the spirit looks like in that church over there uh, Mm. or you know other related kinds of question one of the wrestles that i have around language in the introduction to the book is this kind of recognition that charismatic certainly in the uk is often associated with a more white more middle class um demographic um and kind of expression of faith in the u.s it's not um it charismatic isn't really oh it's uh it's a kind of much more niche um thing and expression um of faith pentecostalism is much it's kind of much more well established um and then so am am i kind of centering i guess my own demographic and spirituality by using this language of charismatic and i think theologically i'm wanting to explore within the book um actually to be charismatic for me means these emphases and the language of emphases means that that can, how that's performed in different settings. And I'm deliberately using examples of um, within each chapter, when I look at the different practices of the spiritual gifts, I'm deliberately using kind of examples from different places around the world um, to show the diversity of ways in which uh, this might be performed. Um, and so the location within which we read it potentially causes us to associate it closely with um with the demographics that we're inhabiting as we read. Um, so, yeah, I'm wanting to have a much more expansive um, understanding of what that can be and a much more kind of flexible that isn't tied to culture. But I think you know, in the UK, there is there is a sense in which um, there is some alignment between a charismatic spirituality and particular demographics. Um, and for us as a church to wrestle with why and how that has come about and what it would look like to, um, yeah, uh to to change to actively and intentionally uh to change that um and who and where are the networks and relationships of people that we need to develop um in order to to learn and to grow and to kind of not be so tied to particular cultural expressions no i certainly thought the um the breadth of examples that you use um as you say chapter by chapter is so helpful and i, I suppose i was particularly thinking of the intrigues intrigued skeptic as it were reading the book and just being reminded of the ways in which whether it's healing for example you know different kinds of healing miracles and experiences of healing testified to in so many different cultural Mm. contexts and contexts Mm. of church and actually it's just good for all of us to be reminded of that sheer breadth of the uh, impact of the kingdom when we can end up sort of worrying about our own particular 
part of the Anglican silo or whatever. You know? mm -hmm. And, you know, I recognise within that that a sociologist would be tearing, you know, how, on what basis am I aligning all of these kind of things to be part of a similar phenomenon? And yet there are these kind of characteristics, these family resemblances between these different, because theologically, I believe, again, back to the unifying work of the spirit who joins together these different diverse expressions and is recognisable as the spirit of Jesus Christ, even in and through these different cultural locations we can't we can't transcend our culture but we can observe and engage with other cultures from our own perspective and 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 where other communities are saying in and by the power of the holy spirit in the name of jesus christ we're you know that um how we how we engage as brothers and sisters how we learn how we recognize ourselves as part of the same thing um i think is ever a challenge within wider structures of um racism and, and uh, all a manner of uh, ways that we seek to divide humans from one another and seeking to celebrate the ways in which the spirit uh, transcends uh, those differences and seeks to break down those uh, oppressive systems that we construct. Yeah, and, and ultimately that is one of the most attractive miracles about the body of Christ, I suppose, isn't it? Just mm -hmm. the, the the relentless diversity uh, mm -hmm. of it. Um, mm -hmm. Well, um, thank you, Helen. Um, we're going to move into prayer now and um, Helen will kick us off. But if anyone would like to um, lead us in prayer briefly, uh, please do feel free to unmute yourself and do that. Um, if we spend a few minutes in silent prayer, that will be fine too. But uh, either way, I will draw things together uh, just before two o'clock. Uh, but thank you on behalf of us all, Helen, and uh, do please lead us in prayer now. Thank you. Thank you. 